This is a Nexus Special, Episode 49, Apple Event, October 2016, on October 27th, 2016. And now, Appleception. This Nexus Special is hosted by Brandon Johnson and Brian Mitchell. Hey, everybody. Hello. So, today was a fun day. What, it what, was indeed. What, what happened? I seem to have forgotten. I know, me too. I guess we're just going to have to recap it together. There we go. So, <laughs> today was Apple's October event of 2016 on... On the new MacBooks is the primary topic. Yeah, uh, over the past, uh, well, maybe not the past couple of years, but for uh, kind of going back the past decade or so, Apple usually does one of these uh, Mac hardware events uh, at least once every couple of years, and it's almost always in October, kind of following a September iPhone slash iPod event. Yeah, the last the last two I remember were probably because I bought Macs released at them, was the October 2008 one where they released the new unibody design. And yep. then during WWDC in 2012 when they released the Retina Display MacBook Pros. Yep. And so this kind yep. of follows that up. There have been the MacBook Air events and the MacBook events have been separate. But for the, the models I care about, those are the two examples I can think of. And yep. Absolutely. So before we get into the details of that, at this... Uh, event, they started it off with a little talk about accessibility and how they're making strides in continuing that along with the Apple Watch and their health health kit applications. And so yeah. they, they released a new page, or maybe not released it, but announced, again, apple.com slash accessibility, where you can see, see what they're working on. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, definitely a really neat thing to see come out of Apple, uh, because... Um, they've in the past been a real uh, kind of strong advocate for uh, including these uh, kind of accessibility features or really not even treating accessibility as a feature at all, but as like a prerequisite uh, for building uh, their technology in a lot of ways. Yeah, and uh, it's just built been... in the UI kit and things too. So it's, it's very easy to support this, these kind of features. Exactly. There's been some kind of high, pri- high profile cases where they have kind of run into some issues or potential issues. In fact, one that we'll discuss right now, uh, or not necessarily right now, but later on in the episode, uh, has to do with something that came out uh, about the uh, the touch bar itself. Uh, spoiler alert, we'll talk about that in a moment. <laughs> uh, but it's really cool to see them kind of renew their commitment uh, with, with uh, their discussion of it in the event and uh, later on the page, they've highlighted a couple of features that are, uh, as we mentioned, kind of baked in switch control on Mac, which is one of the like most low key awesome features uh, for for um, really anybody to to use um, uh, a Mac. Um, if, I don't know if you've, you've seen this before, but it's essentially using alternative input mechanism that kind of can uh, can kind of uh, be almost like purpose built for. Uh, however you would like to interact with your Mac. Uh, and it's, um, you know, sometimes accessibility features can seem like the sort of thing that is like done to like make uh, like accommodations for somebody who might have def- difficulty using uh, what's what somebody might call like a, a, a regular old keyboard and mouse, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but switch control is really super useful. Uh, even even if you, you, uh, you prefer a keyboard and mouse as your uh, standard method of input, it, it can be useful for adding... Uh, like additional uh, kind of ways to interact with your Mac in a really neat way. So a, a lot of these uh, accessibility uh, uh, case studies that they provide kind of expand on that commitment, which is way neat. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I need to look into all these a little more after after we record this. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah I'd definitely say check out Switch Control. Way, way, way cool. I will, yeah. Anyhow, uh, after that, they got into a little bit about a uh, new TV? No, that's not quite no, right. No, same TV. Same TV, but a new app called TV. Uh, so this is an TV app on Apple TV? Apple TV TV? TV. <laughs> Apple TV squared. Apple TV section. Uh, right? I know. A TV within a TV within a TV. Um, we have to go another level deeper. Uh, the uh, kind of interesting thing about this is uh, it's available for iOS and for Apple TV, uh, but not for the Mac, uh, which is kind of interesting because somebody had mentioned at one point that uh, somebody made an offhand remark. Somebody at Apple had made some offhand remark about uh, it being available on all your devices, which is uh, clearly not true. Yeah, uh, which is <laughs> like uh, a little bit a little bit striking too, especially considering that this uh, event was 
kind of set up as being a Mac focused event. It's kind of yeah. weird that like one of the things that they announced just totally left the Mac. Uh, I thought it was the dust there. Yeah, it was a little bizarre, but apparently a, a Mac is a Mac. It's not a device. It's more than a device. <laughs> Yeah, that's... But it's not an implementation of the device. Right, exactly. I I guess I'll buy that, I guess. Um, But uh, kind of interestingly, uh, this kind of TV app can encapsulate a bunch of different channels uh, or other items you might might be using on an Apple TV to just, like, access content. HBO Now was showcased, as were Showtime and Hulu. Uh, I think CBS was as well. CBS? Okay, right on. Um... I, I think there are others, uh, but they're perhaps not announced quite yet. Um, conspicuously, Netflix was absent from this, and uh, as always, as uh, we discussed in the fringe, um, uh, Netflix Amazon. still hasn't released. Or yeah, Amazon, Amazon still hasn't released a Prime video app, uh, which they and, said they would almost a year ago. I'm still patiently waiting. Yeah, someday, someday, we can hope. Goodness gracious! So I watched this section. Just kind of thinking, it's it's not good. it's not for me. I'm not going to use it because I don't know how many of these require a subscription or signing in with a cable provider because I don't have either, and I'm not very yeah. interested in any any model. So maybe I would use this if I could just tune into network TV like CBS or NBC. But that's about the only case I think I would ever use something like this. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, yeah, definitely in, in my case, like CBS is one that, uh, I know you, it's very difficult to access CBS unless you have a cable subscription. Um, Hulu is another add on subscription, as you mentioned, but I, I don't, the, the marginal utility isn't there for me. Uh, yep. doesn't, doesn't surmount the marginal cost. Uh, HBO now, I have to say like for, with all the hype about Westworld, I'm kind of into it. I've um, heard good things about that show. Do you watch it? Yeah. Uh, I see I tried to watch uh, the first episode that was available uh, kind of I think it is still available for free to watch uh, on on the HBO website uh, for Westworld but I don't the streaming experience that I had just trying to watch that episode free was not great um, but I've heard that HBO now is just stellar so I, I, yeah. I might be I've worth giving that a try um, so maybe it was just a fluke of trying to watch something in a web browser I don't know yeah. um, we'll see yeah, yes, it's time indeed. to watch TV. <laughs> oh, too good, too perfect. Uh, well, anyhow, I think it's just about time for us to get on to the real kind of meat of this announcement, uh, and that is the long, long-awaited new MacBook Pros. Who finally? How long has it been? It it was over five hundred days, I believe. Yep, uh, definitely over a year and a half since the last refresh. Um, I think it's been probably since close to three years. July 2012, since they released the design of the current ones. So the slimmer unibody. That's like four years. Yeah, it's, it's been a while. <laughs> oh my goodness. So the, the main new feature they announced is what was called Touch Bar. So this kind of leaked out of um, the macOS Sierra 10.1 or no, 10.12.1 update earlier this week. There are some right. photos of this touch bar, but people called it the magic toolbar. That <laughs> is apparently not the case. So yeah, touch Apple bar really is... big on Apple isn't really big on that toolbar phrase, are they? No, I don't think they like the word toolbar, but they like the word magic. So I'm, I, you know, I thought they would maybe call it the magic bar, but that, but that just kind of sounds like not what it is, and who knows? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So touch bar. So this is a Retina display, touchscreen display that's redundant. Anyway, on top of your keyboard where the function keys normally were. So this replaces things like escape, brightness controls, expose, sorry, uh, mission control, launchpad, keyboard brightness, media controls, volume, and power or eject, depending on what kind of keyboard you're coming from. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that this allows you to do is in uh, whatever application you might be running, they, that application might be able to expose certain functions to the keyboard uh, in a way that they're kind of quicker to access uh, and more discoverable than just like a keyboard combination. And for me, like the biggest uh, gosh darn like example of this is Photoshop, uh, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, or really any of the Adobe apps, because um, 
like those Adobe Creative Cloud applications are very heavily dependent on uh, you being kind of either willing to dig through menus for days on end to figure out the function you need or to know the keyboard combination off the top of your head to do it instantly. Uh, so efficiency is very much kind of driven by stuff like that and that leads to things like the uh, the Wacom uh, Intuos touchpad or um, drawing tablets, right, that you can attach to a computer and have, they also have those function keys that you can map to certain actions that you might do frequently. Um, that's really uh, why I see this being included on a, on a, on a pro product. Um, and that's going to be uh, really neat. In fact, Apple recently released uh, human interface guidelines about this that kind of specify that a little bit further and actually kind of goes back a little bit to what we were talking about with related to accessibility. So um, one of the tricks is that um, whenever you expose a new way for developers to access an interface and allow users to do something, is that there's a possibility that maybe somebody could define an action for the touch bar that could only be done on the touch bar, which mm. is a huge accessibility issue because uh, there's no like tactile difference uh, from one part of the touch bar to another, right? So it's very difficult um, to... Uh, uh, to use unless you're sighted, right? Because uh, you you need to be able to distinguish what where the touch uh, it targets kind of begin and end. Um, however, there's uh, there's some uh, stipulations in the human interface guidelines aimed at preventing this, which is really awesome to see. And there will be a link in the show notes about exactly that. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about this. I think it's a big ex- uh, you know extension of the the sub menus and things i'll often when using photoshop or something will just pull up the help menu and search for what i want because i know what it's called but i have no idea where it is and so i'll mm-hmm. often do that and so this you know kind of will let a developer say here are the most common things or helpful features that you can apply to what you're working on and it can it can make it easier and then they showed an example with the photos app where you were editing a photo and applying filters, and it can do a little preview of each filter on the photo, just on your keyboard. So maybe, you know, s- too small to really see the details, but you can see the overall effect that something might have. And they also used a Logic Pro 10 example where, or maybe it was Final Cut Pro 10, where the the tracks in your timeline were little lines on the touch bar, and there's a plan yeah. moving across. So you could see when something else was coming up, you could kind of anticipate change and see when another section was starting. And so it's just small visual cues that can help assist and streamline a process, but it doesn't take anything away or and it doesn't add something that you can't get elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. That is a very uh, good way to put it. Uh, and that's exactly what I think makes this such an interesting addition. Um, I think you're right too to call out stuff like uh, Final Cut Pro 10 and Logic Pro 10 because these are definitely pro apps where those uh, shortcuts are kind of uh, kind of crucial, right? Or those those functions are kind of uh, crucial and you used to be able to access them through keyboard shortcuts alone or through digging through menus. Uh, and that is kind of the problem that the touch bar seems to be solving. Uh, another thing that was kind of uh, got a lot of press was that people were saying that there's a potential for the escape key to be removed uh, from this MacBook. And uh, while, yes, there is no physical escape key button any longer, it does seem like it's pretty omnipresent uh, on the touch bar nowadays. So uh, Vim users, uh, NeoVim users, it's all cool. Or you could like always map the escape function to something else if need be. Well, I think, uh, <laughs> I think escape was added later in Vim. I think control left bracket does, control left bracket does the same thing, but ah. escape escape is a little more recognizable and makes more sense to how our shortcuts and interfaces work today. That's true. So I saw, I saw on Twitter, the side of things, no, we want our escape key. And the other side of things like, Hey, you should just use this anyway, because that's what the the shortcut is. (laughs) Yep. So I getcha. Or you could remap it to anything else. You could remap it to the tilde key if you want, or to yeah. to tab, if you really want to mess with yourself. I have a friend (laughs) at the U of M Morris who, who, maps caps lock to escape and that throws me off i cannot that is that's <laughs> difficult <laughs> that's actually pretty intelligent i might end up doing that myself but that might also ruin everything yeah well we'll, we'll see i'll because yeah in, when i'm typing something and when i miss the a key i'll just hit escape and then i'm out of the text field and i'm just doing whatever and whatever other application i'm in yep i getcha i getcha 
What do you say we get onto some tech specs? Yeah. So there were three new models released here, two in the 13-inch size and one in the 15-inch size. So we'll first talk about some features that apply to all of these, and then we'll go into the specific details between each of the three models. Right on. So um, I'll just I'll just begin to say, because we just talked about the touch bar, that is on the, the higher-end 13-inch Pro and the 15-inch Pro. So the, the lower-end Pro has the same function keys that you are used to on your current uh, MacBook keyboards. Mm-hmm. So all models come with a headphone port and at least two Thunderbolt 3 ports. So these have the USB Type-C connector and are Thunderbolt 3, so the third generation, they can go up to 40 gigabits per second per, per port. So I'm a huge fan of this because um, the Thunderbolt 3 USB-C allows for charging over this port, so you can charge in any port on your computer, so you don't have to necessarily unplug and replug. Not with, with MagSafe, you can only charge them there, but if you have something plugged in your sharing ports, you can plug in all of them. It's not like they said, okay, only this port can be used for charging, but it can also be used for data transfer, for example. So it's, it allows for very high speeds, and since Thunderbolt is basically an external PCIe bus, a lot of things can be implemented on top of it, where USB is a little higher level, and it doesn't allow for as many direct-to-your-computer types of connections. Absolutely. So the result is that you can really run a bunch of other protocols on top of Thunderbolt. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then e- even on top of that, you can run a bunch of protocols on top of USB on top of Thunderbolt, which is awesome and how, a little bit How deep will you go? <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, Thunderboltception. <laughs> Everything is a Christopher Nolan movie. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's definitely really exciting. Uh, certainly the item about just like being able to charge from any port just blew my mind uh because like uh so one issue that i've had with uh retina macbook pro in the past is that there's one usb port that's a little bit less reliable than the other usb port uh so one side of the of the um one side of the computer has one usb port the other side of the computer has another usb port and it seemed like the the usb port on the far side so there's that longer bank of ports on the left and the shorter bank of ports on the right Mm -hmm. Um, the one on the right side seemed to not always uh, work correctly when dealing with audio interfaces or really uh, or, or yeah or like um, a, web- a webcam or something or like a camera. I haven't, that we I haven't come to. across that at all. It's probably it's almost certainly just a defect with this particular computer, but okay. it was really it's really kind of intriguing because there's there's certainly like a uh, a port wise like difference like you can tell that it's not like that is like a, a child board of the logic of the larger logic board right yeah um and as as a result right like that connection just was flaky and wouldn't like would not be reliable for us hmm. uh, so we had to use everything that was on the main board uh, main kind of port bank there on the left side instead so this this seems like um like they are like standing behind the ports on both sides of the computer which is awesome (laughs) yeah so um i guess we can mention the differences here so the the low end 13 inch has two and i think they're on the left maybe i actually haven't looked at the the pictures so there it only has two on the left two on the left so is the headphone on the left too or is that on the right um all these photos are of just the the high-end one so it's harder to tell yeah so well, at least the, the higher-end 13-inch has headphone port on the right, which is new from existing MacBooks, which might be an issue for you, maybe not. <laughs> but, um, so, with with two ports on the left, you can charge in the same style and use them for either. And then on the other, the higher-end ones, you have two on the left, two on the right, so you can plug in everything from both sides. So there is um, an example... That I think Mark Gurman tweeted he, at the the hands-on after this presentation, Apple yeah. had a MacBook Pro with two Ray drives and two 5K displays plugged into it, because uh-huh. it can it can power this many, which we'll get to in a little bit. So it just looked a little strange with like two pretty beefy cords coming out of the side of this computer, but <laughs> that allows for you to connect things on whatever side is more convenient at the time. Yeah, absolutely. So, the next on our list, I think, is the most important, the color. (laughs) Maybe not most (laughs) important. But 
This come previously all MacBook Pros came in silver, but now you can also come in space gray, which is the default selected option when you purchase this on Apple's website. So maybe that's the default official color of this generation. I do have to say that space gray MacBook Pro looks pretty darn awesome. Like if I were to purchase a computer today, it would definitely be a space gray MacBook Pro. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It just it just looks so so great. Yeah, I really like it. And... Uh, I didn't get any like sort of stats as to what how well it matches the space gray iPhone or the space gray MacBook or the space gray iPad, but presumably like from from what we've seen in the past, it seems like they're anodizing it in the exact same way, so it's going to look, you know, it's going to match pretty well with your with, with your phone, your watch, your uh, iPad if if you uh, if if you have if if you want to be an all space gray individual yeah well they apple's had a couple different black gray colors over the years so the iphone 5 had the slate gray which is kind of a blue gray Mm -hmm. and then they introduced a space gray and then i think they introduced they had another space gray that was a little bit different in brightness i think it was a little lighter right and so i would assume this matches the 12 inch macbook in color just because it's a macbook that's just an assumption, though. I have no idea. I have not seen one of these in, in person. Yep. yep. So with this new color, they kind of adopt a slimmer case design, um, meaning that in addition to that, the screen is thinner, which also means they don't have a backlit Apple logo. So rip backlit Apple logo. Rip indeed. And so with this new design, it means the computers are a lot thinner and lighter. Um, they They compared the... The 13-inch MacBook Air, which is still for sale, they discontinued the 11-inch MacBook Air, and they compared the 13-inch MacBook Air to the 13-inch MacBook Pro, and the MacBook Pro was, despite the same screen size, much smaller in footprint than the MacBook Air. Now, I think the MacBook Air has a much larger bezel, and that's why, but it shows that they're really compacting down and making a small product. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that's kind of interesting too. I guess I didn't do the weight comparison uh, among the two, but like the the 13 inch MacBook Air, um, it, I, I had the opportunity to work with one for a couple of years, and it was it was pretty darn uh, comfortable, right? Uh, and even yeah. the the 15 inch uh, Retina MacBook Pro that I'm using right now is not uh, definitely not onerous, but to have it uh, kind of closer to that, um, close, closer to that, like. Uh, weight, I guess, would was is going to be pretty remarkable. Yeah, I think it's three pounds for the thirteen inch and four pounds for the fifteen inch, so it's a little bit lighter on both models. But yeah, the 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 air and the thirteen inch the same weight. So, and I would imagine the weight distribution is a little more even in the MacBook Pro because it's mm-hmm. not a wedge shape. So yeah, that might definitely. be something. I know in the MacBook Air, you pick it up and you feel like the thing's going to snap in half because it's so thin when you're grabbing on, but there's all the weights in the back. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with this different color and removal of Apple logo, the, the screen has been upgraded with in, or in all of the Macro Pro models. So it is 67% brighter at 500 nits. Now, the Apple Watch Series 2 is 1,000 nits for a comparison, and that is, I think, the one of the brightest displays ever made by apple or ever made by apple yeah yeah and it's probably a lot easier to do because it's such a smaller screen right yeah um uh and like uh to to power a screen the size of a macbook screen uh at at you know double the level of brightness of this new laptop would probably be a considerate uh considerable uh battery kind of drain there battery Uh, and space i would imagine yeah for sure so uh, with with all that in mind, this seems like a pretty darn awesome. Uh, yeah, and it's still it's still sixty seven percent brighter, which is a pretty considerable amount. So I think there's there's really no issue. My two thousand twelve MacBook Pro gets very bright, and that seems fine to me. And this is even brighter than that. So, yep, agreed. Though along with that display, uh, we get a wider color gamut. This has been uh, a selling point for a lot of Apple products of late. Uh, going back to, I believe the iPad Air 2 was the f- uh, the first pro- product that I can recall where they've started kind of naming these uh, color gamut uh, improvements uh, among the specifications. Uh, this uh, the this generation of MacBook Pros uh, fits along the P3 specification, uh, which is uh, wider than the previous generation. I believe that's the s- that's uh, similar to 
the iPad Pro, but now that I say that, I should... I think it's the same as the iPad Pro and iPhone 7, iPhone 7 right. camera. Yeah, so it allows for 25% um, more vivid colors than the sRGB color profile. So it's using, I think, 10-bit color instead of 8, if, yep. I, if I'm correct there. So it's richer colors. And I'm, I'm excited for this. When I eventually buy one of these, I can look at photos from iPhone 7 and see color-accurate representations of it versus yeah. a slightly more muted version. Yep, absolutely. That's going to be awesome. Uh, next, on to some uh, more kind of basic stats. Uh, the kind of base level is 256 uh, gigabyte solid state drive. Uh, that is a PCI uh, drive, as you might imagine. So there's no way that PCIe drive is ever going to be removed. Uh, it's soldered on. You've uh, no ho- no hope of replacement or repair there. <laughs> yeah, and it's upgraded to I think three. Oh gosh, three gigabytes per second read and two or something right i don't have these numbers in front of me but it's even faster than before and i think apple's really been pushing this ahead for for read write speed yeah that's awesome absolutely along with that the base models have three uh have eight gigabytes of ram uh which we just uh noticed was ddr3 uh, so it's not going to be quite ddr4 performance there but still uh at tw- uh 2133 megahertz that's nothing to sneeze at uh, upgradable to 16, I believe, uh, on the highest end. Uh, so yeah. your options there are 8 Which is a little 16. surprising that they don't offer a 32 gigabyte model. I'm not quite sure why they, they don't do that. Yeah, I'm with you there. I was definitely, like, I was I was p- holding out for a 32 gig model if if, uh, if it were to happen. And it looks like it's not in the cards this time around. But what is in the cards is Skylake, which means that uh, at some point, hopefully they'll upgrade to Cabby Lake, at which point... Uh, that 32 gig model might be more uh, more a more reasonable thing to expect, wouldn't you say? I w- yeah, I would imagine they might even. I don't know if they're holding back for Cabby Lake, but you know they could release Cabby Lake with 32 gigs or up to as a max configuration, and then mm-hmm. introduce DDR4. So I'd imagine they would do that all at the same time. Yeah, definitely. And so they're you know they skipped Broadwell, which I don't think Intel ever made these higher performance mobile CPUs for. They definitely did not make any desktop class CPUs for Broadwell. So they they went from generation 4 to 6 and Cabby Lake is starting to come out in some of the the performance levels, but I guess not at the scale or um, types that the MacBook Pro needs. Yeah, unfortunately they're still kind of uh playing uh according to Intel's calendar there, which uh has has been uh oft reported that it's not necessarily the most advantageous for Apple on that front. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sitting here with my over four-year-old MacBook Pro that has only today been two generations older in terms of CPU. So I'd say that's, <laughs> for, from my point of view, it's pretty good for buying yeah. at the time. So so your, your MacBook Pro has been current for a number of years. <laughs> well, yeah, it was, it's, an, right? it's an Ivy Bridge. So it was, it was current for... I think Haswell seemed a little late too. Like it was current CPU generation or the newest model till I bought it July. I think that October or November, maybe they Mm -hmm. upgraded to a higher speed bumped CPU of Ivy bridge. And then the next year or something, they released Haswell, but then they stayed on Haswell till today. So it's been the same CPUs for (laughs) three years, I think on the MacBook pro. Uh, that is unbelievable. <laughs> but now you wow. get an upgrade, so... Exactly. The upgrade's right here. And speaking of upgrades, guess what got an upgrade? What? Speakers! Oh, no way! This has also been uh, kind of a common thread among other Apple products, too, with the iPad Pro getting uh, getting kind of redesigned speakers. Uh, and I believe uh, the iPhones as well, uh, starting with the iPhone 7 generation. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Absolutely. Well, yeah, absolutely. And the waterproofing on that front, which we're not seeing here, but we are seeing some other pretty uh, tangible benefits, including 57, uh, 58% uh, higher volume uh, can be attained up to 2.5 times louder bass. So if you're interested in uh, dropping some sick beats, uh, hopefully uh, it's not headphones with illnesses, but uh, if Yep. <laughs> Bad pun. Uh, but uh, if, if, you're, if you're interested in that sort of thing, 
uh, these speakers uh, maybe will do it for you a little bit better than the previous ones. Uh, and perhaps most interestingly, they've doubled the dynamic range, kind of in the same uh, vein as the increasing the color gamut. The sound can be a little bit more vivid, uh, of a greater degree of variability there. That's uh, definitely going to be worthwhile um, if, if you listen to a lot of music out of your MacBook speakers, as many folks do. Yeah, I'm excited to, to, to hear them. I remember getting my 2008 MacBook to getting my 2012 Retina Display MacBook Pro. So that was going, you know, 13 inch to 15 inch with a four year difference, but the speakers were significantly better in the 15 inch MacBook Pro. So I'm excited to hear if it's kind of the same difference upgrading from the previous generation to this one. Yeah, absolutely. Now another thing in here is they they expanded the force touch trackpad. So they basically made it as large as there was a space. So it, um, I think on the 15 inch, it's about twice as big. So previously there is, it was the same size on all their computers with a little gap between like the space bar and the top of the force tra- touch trackpad and the bottom hinge lip and the trackpad. But now they just blow it up as big as they can and have it there. So I think they're really pushing for a multi-touch and using, I guess, finger strokes maybe even for, you know, drawing or something. I don't know why you would need such a massive one if you weren't in the future thinking of using it for more creative uses. Yeah, see, I was hoping that they would introduce Apple Pencil support, um, but Ooh, it doesn't that would seem be like that's awesome. Right? Yeah. Uh, like that's how you like Sherlock those uh, pen input tablets that we were discussing earlier. Um, you just you just make that the Apple Pencil uh, an option for to, to be used on that. But, you know, I, I guess another kind of logical conclusion to this is we just do away with keyboards and trackpads altogether. The entire uh, lower uh, half of the laptop becomes a touch surface uh, <laughs> and it can be dynamically reconfigurable, whether it's a keyboard, whether it's a, a trackpad, whether it's all just a thing that you can draw on with a pencil. Uh, it, like that's that's, you know, so so long as goofy people like me are uh, are hypothesizing here, we may as well hypothesize all the way to the end. <laughs> so do you want just a MacBook that's two screens that fold together and you can configure the bottom and have a virtual keyboard and pencil surface? Maybe within the next ten years, but right now I, I'm 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 fine. Like that's that's kind of where I see this all heading. Uh, and they, yes, they can call it the MacBook DS, and, <laughs> and I, I'm cool with it. Um, uh, they just need to also include a little spot for me to attach the Apple Pencil. Uh, that's, that's yeah. And maybe maybe uh, when I buy it, it should come with three Apple Pencils. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Now we'll we'll just see over the next few years the, the touch bar just slowly grow larger and larger <laughs> and larger. Right, until it swallows up everything else. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see. So, and one one last thing on the topic of input controls is the keyboard has now been upgraded to a new second generation butterfly keyed keyboard. So the previous MacBook Pros had their more traditional flat keys that you push down. Um, I think they're they're not butterfly keys. What are they? They Rings. had a button, a button mechanism? Yeah. I don't know the formal name. But it's the, the keys you've seen on MacBook since 2006 when the MacBook came out. So they've been around a while. People have grown to like them, but they, they caused a little controversy back then. And so here are the butterfly keys coming, causing a little more controversy. <laughs> Marco Um mm-hmm. So we'll we'll see. I'm curious to see what these are like. They're supposed to be, they're supposed to have four times more key stability. I'm not quite sure what this means. Maybe it's a response back because I know the current 12 inch MacBook, which has the first generation butterfly keys, you yep. you press them and you can barely feel that you're pressing them because it doesn't travel very far, and there's not much of a feedback when you do press. Yes, indeed. That's kind of the um, the difficulty. Yeah. So, what what can we find on the low end thirteen inch model? Yeah. So this is the one that uh, issues the uh, the touch bar. So that's not going to be in place. Uh, but you can get those two Thunderbolt three ports along with uh, integrated Intel Iris graphics, two microphones, uh, that fancy new sixty one watt USB C power adapter. Uh, eight gigabytes of RAM, uh, five. Uh, I actually don't think this one has a five twelve uh, gigabyte solid state drive. I think that one's two fifty six. Yeah, I think they all start baseline of two fifty six. Right, 
Um, but with all that will run you uh, 1,499 United States dollars. All right. So a little bit of a price hike, but new features. So maybe it's maybe it's all, it's all right there. And now they, they do get twice as many ports to charge from. You, you you know, no longer just the MagSafe. That is twice a good way much, to think about it. Right? You're paying for that extra port. That's Can you charge it twice as fast if you plug in two, two power adapters? That's how it yes, works, indeed. right? That is how it works, I'm pretty sure. So then the 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 next level 13-inch MacBook Pro has the touch bar, and this comes with four Thunderbolt 3 ports and um, same 8 gigabytes of RAM. However, it has a speed of 2133 megahertz of its RAM versus the lower end 13-inch has a 1866 megahertz speed. So these are overclocked a little more. I think DDR3 can only be... I think the native speed of DDR3 is 1600 or 1333 megahertz. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But they're overclocked to be faster, to I think be more comparable to DDR4 in terms of speed. Yep. And it contains Intel Iris Graphics 550, so one tenth place higher than the low end 13 inch. Three microphones instead of two, and also a 60 watt, 61 watt USB power adapter. And this will run you $1,799. So $300 more expensive. Yeah, and not too shabby. Yeah, it seems like a good a good mid range, though probably more expensive than many people want to want to pay. I bet we'll see a lot of. I think we'll see some of these, but I think we'll more more likely see a lot of the low end thirteen inch and the fifteen inch. Mm-hmm. That's just my hunch. That's true. Which leads us into the kind of distinguishing features of the fifteen inch. Uh, it has uh, many of the same uh, uh, options you've got on that thirteen inch. So the four Thunderbolt three ports that with the USB C connector. Uh, touch bar with integrated touch ID sensor. This one goes up to two terabytes of solid state storage, uh, though it starts out with a 256 standard. Uh, I believe that's the case with the 13 inch as well. You can get up to two terabytes of storage there if you wish. Uh, again, starting with that same eight gigabytes of 2133 megahertz DDR3. Um, it also has an integrated graphics card, but this one's kind of interesting. Uh, it starts out with an Intel HD graphics 530, so it's not the Iris Pro. Uh, integrated graphics that you'd usually see on the other two sets. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a models. lower powered integrated card than the other but, two. But yes, want to take it away, Brian? <laughs> but you also get standard in all 15 inch models. A AMD Radeon Pro 450 is the minimum. You can also upgrade that to a 455, and these both come with two gigabytes of GDDR5 memory. Or if you go for a more advanced card, you can get the Radeon Pro 460 that comes with four gigabytes of GDDR5. And so this brings automatic graphic switching stock to any 15-inch MacBook Pro. So this was the case more so on the earlier Retina displays, I believe. I think mm-hmm. those had uh, the they had the NVIDIA 650M card that I don't think it came on all of them, but all but the lowest end 15-inch had it. And now they're making it on all of them. And now, I th- or before... Before today, I think the 15-inch MacBook Pro, you could get a GPU, but it was the by far the most expensive model, and it, you maybe even had to upgrade to get the discrete GPU in there. Yep, absolutely. I think other than that, like the the I know my uh, unibody MacBook that I purchased was uh, just a regular old MacBook. That one wasn't a MacBook Pro. Uh, back in 2008, this is, and it was, I think, the only MacBook... Uh, of its generation to have a discrete graphics card. And that was a a, a, a 430M, a, a NVIDIA GeForce 430M. But that was the, the kind of the last time Apple went with NVIDIA as a uh, an integrated, or as a as a integration partner, I guess, for these discrete yeah. GPUs. Don't we have the same MacBook? I have, because my, my t- late 2008 Luna MacBook, it's a higher end model. It has a NVIDIA 9, 9400M. Oh, 9400M. Uh, okay. With, yeah, uh, you're right. With 256 megabytes of, of video RAM. Oof. Yep. This is definitely a uh, massive trade-up from that. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, and, and uh, about eight, nine years later, too, so it's uh, Very definitely true. Time, time for that update. So these, these MacBook Pros, the 15-inch, can drive up to two displays at 5K resolution at 60 hertz at over a billion colors. So this is at the P3, so this is an insane amount of pixels, as well as the built-in display. So that's, I think, they mentioned 35 million pixels. You can do the math, it's probably rounded there. Or up to four 4K displays at 60 hertz. 
So this is just an insane amount of pixels that it can push. It's definitely unbelievable. I think the, the old MacBook Pros, you could push a lot, but not quite at the rate that you can here. I think that maybe was limited to 30 hertz or something. Yep, absolutely. And the inclusion of Thunderbolt 3 definitely helps this out. So uh, Thunderbolt 2, couldn't, I believe, couldn't necessarily drive uh, fi multiple 5K displays. Um, I don't think Thunderbolt 2 could drive a 5K display. I oh, think in the 5K right. iMac, Apple had yep. to do some custom display driver to drive the display. I think it under the hood it uses two different display port <laughs> connections to drive it. Yes, you're correct, you're correct. I, I, I remember this now. So that that this is all now packed into uh, a portable uh, a laptop like this is so uh, like awesome. Way cool. Thanks and to, to match yeah, forty gigabit for per second. <laughs> Absolutely. And of course to match uh, this uh, fifteen inch model has a beefier power adapter, eighty seven watts uh, still charging over any of those four Thunderbolt 3 USB Type-C ports. That's two watts more than the previous generation MacBook Pro at 15 inches. Oh, I did not realize that. But it's much beefier in comparison to the 13-inch. The uh, yeah, which is it's, it's about the same. Before this, the the MacBook Airs had a 45 watt, the 13-inch MacBook Pro had a 60, and the 15 had an 85. So 61 to 87, so slight differences. Getting squeezing all the power out that they can. And this yep. one will run you $2,399 at its base. However, you could upgrade the MacBook Pro so much that it will cost how much, Brandon? I believe it was $4,300 unless you start adding software, which will take it up to 4800 Yeah, so just a crazy amount of money. And I think this is almost $1,000 more expensive at its max configuration than the previous generation. So you can get a lot more out of it. And to correct you earlier, Brandon, you said... It started with 512 gigabytes of PCI SSD. That's on the higher end model. The lower end 15 inch comes with 256 gigs. Ah, right, 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 right. Yes, apologies there. Yeah. So I think the one thing we kind of forgot to talk about was Touch ID, actually. You mentioned it ah. in the 15 inch. So in this touch bar, there is also a Touch ID sensor on the end. And so you can use it for things like Apple Pay. There's a T1 chip on the motherboard here, which acts as the secure enclave for the, the computer. And there's also a cool feature where if the computer is locked or something, you can just touch ID and log in. Or if you're a different user, you touch ID and switch user. I think it was even to the point where if you were logged in and someone else who's a user on the computer touches ID, touch IDs, it'll just switch user from the current session to that one. Which is pretty awesome. I don't necessarily know of a situation where somebody has like a a laptop that's consistently used by multiple people, except for maybe like a shared laptop for presentations or something at, at the office. Um, but one of the things that I could see this being really awesome is for like an admin user, right? Like, um, yeah. for example, oh, totally. on, my, on, on my work laptop, like uh, there's there are like situations where like I just want to be able to leave my laptop with my um, with my uh, uh, with my uh, pal in operations who uh, who's like the, the domain admin to, to get some new software installed or something. He can do that really, uh, really quickly and like really kind of like space AG just by uh, logging in with his thumb, <laughs> right? That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it. I'm assuming you know, everything's local so you can't like sync thumbprints through iCloud because that kind of breaks the whole idea of the secure it, archive. It doesn't so mean... I don't see admins using it too much because they would then have to authenticate every admin user as an admin on every computer they deploy. But I mean, I they, think... they already have to set that up in other ways, though, is, is all I'm... Yeah. 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 I think it would <laughs> depend on the size of the company and, and who it is. I That's see it true. More My company's as a, kind of smallish. <laughs> more as a use in, like, a family situation where you have... Oh, that makes sense. You know, a sibling or a parent that also uses the computer. I think that's the most likely likely case in my eyes. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So I think that pretty much summarizes everything. It does indeed. I guess that only leads us to uh, the last question. Uh, are you getting anything out of, out, out of today? Are you purchasing anything out of the items that were announced, do you think? Personally, no. Though, however, I have already purchased a 13-inch MacBook Pro with the touch bar, just the baseline there for my father who is in grad school and needs a computer. 
You'll actually right. be borrowing mine a couple times because this one won't arrive in time for him to need one. But that is a new computer that will be in the household for the time being. And I'm excited to take a look at it and play around with it. As for uh-huh. myself, I think I might be replacing my 15-inch MacBook Pro from 2012. Some point, maybe next summer. We'll see. It depends how, how much I feel like I use it. When I when I bought it, I it was my only computer, so I wanted a 15-inch all the way upgraded. Though now with my Hackintosh, I, I use that more often than my MacBook, though it's nice to have a good, powerful mobile computer as well. So I'm not sure what I'll do. Probably wait for Cabby Lake CPUs, DDR4, and then I'll probably get a 15-inch, but not all the way upgraded. That's yep. my hunch. Uh, my perspective is almost exactly uh, the same. My sister actually just bought a laptop a little bit ago. She ended up getting a MacBook uh, Space Gray, uh, but okay. the kind of the, the the not the Air, but the 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 uh, smaller 13 or 12-inch uh, portable there. Uh, and yeah. she adores that thing. Um, but I don't think anyone else in my family is going to be picking up one of these anytime soon. However, I will probably be looking into this once again uh, after I graduate from the U and uh, might have uh, greater use for a personal laptop. Right now, everything is kind of like, well, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing schoolwork, I'll use my computer that I have set aside for school. And if I'm doing classwork or if, if I'm doing work for work, uh, I want to use a company computer so then I can do all the VPN stuff and uh, you know, generate all the appropriate uh, logs and audits and stuff that uh, that are uh, that kind of are demanded of software engineers. So, <laughs> yeah, right? my my dream has been to have a 15 inch MacBook Pro that is super lightweight. I want one that's pow- my you know my ideal world is to have like a quad core with hyper threading, 15 inch super powerful computer that's like it the as thick as a hair. But that you know that's not possible. <laughs> but we're getting closer. Right. We're dropping half a pound off, so I think that's gonna help. I've I've debated getting a thirteen inch because it's lighter, but then I lose screen real estate, so I and I lose two extra hard physical cores as well as right. four virtual cores. So it's 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 I feel like I'll still go towards the side of power rather than than physical form. But Yeah, definitely difficult to justify going back to a thirteen as somebody who's been using a fifteen inch uh, laptop for the past four months <laughs> yeah and especially when i was on my 13 inch i remember just i you know just a year or two after getting it i just could not wait to get a 15 inch because of the screen real estate and i think i should remember that for every future purchase <laughs> unless i want to run in scaled mode which i don't because uh <laughs> that's going to be more taxing on graphics and look yep. more fuzzy Yes, indeed. Well, it's all because you don't have the iPad uh, iPad Pro's uh, desktop quality display scaler. Yes, or the, the the iPhone Plus models as well. Yep. Yes, indeed. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Cool, cool. Well, well I think that just about does it. Yeah. Where Where can we find you on the internet? Well, you can find me just about anywhere on the internet, but uh, especially uh, on the Twitters where I am Brandon underscore MN. That's B-R-A-N-D-O-N underscore M-N. You can also go to Brandon.MN, which is uh, my blog of sorts, where I sometimes write things about how uh, fun it is to compile Ruby uh, on a uh, Mac that's running Sierra and kind of has some other, shall we say, complicating factors. Um that's that's one post that came up. You can also find both of us, I believe, uh, on a podcast that we uh, do on this very uh, this very network called Podkit, where we talk about uh, life as Apple inclined developers. Uh, so that's that's uh, a new episode shall be forthcoming shortly, I believe, if the stars align, uh, and yes. it'll be pretty great to get the gang back together there. Uh, yes. How about you, Brian? Where can we find you? You can find me on Twitter at underscore Brian Mitchell underscore. That is Mitchell with two L's and Brian with an I. You can also find me on my website at brianm.me, where you can find all my other social media profiles, as well as some blog posts, notably my now, you know, month old iPhone 7 review, which has some nice photos. Thank you to Ian R. Buck for using his camera for those nice shots. And yeah, you can find me on the internet. I'm not too hard to reach. Right on. Well, thanks for uh, chatting with me about this, Brian. It's awesome. I know yeah. that the Twitter conversation about this has been brilliant as well. 
Uh, so, yeah, it's been really awesome. Yeah, I'll just hold out till the Touch ID magic keyboard. Right on. That is, <laughs> yes, indeed. Fingers well, crossed. Uh, yes, indeed. We'll we'll see if that comes along with uh, Cabby Lake, eh? <laughs> there we go. Yes. Right well, on. until next time. Until next time, indeed. Have a good one. Have a good one.